Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kevan Davani. I have a very, very special guest today. Um, it's uh, Gigi, who, you know, I mean, there, is no, there are no coincidences, I always say, or whatever you, uh, one understands under the definition of coincidence. But we, uh, by coincidence or not, we found out we are both uh, principally living and residing in Austria. Uh, Gigi is from Austria, and, but uh, he's been traveling uh, 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 around the world, and I've been following him for now, a, uh, you know, a long time, and uh, reading his his, uh, I mean, awesome, really amazing articles. Gigi, why don't you just introduce yourself um, a little bit about your background, how you came to the topic, uh, to the to this realm of, of of Bitcoin and and technology, Austrian economics, and the essence of money. Sure. Thank Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me as well. Um, yeah. So I stumbled into Bitcoin a couple of years ago and it was a slow process for me. And I, I'm sure, um, yeah, many share a similar fate. So I've, I've heard of it a couple of times and thought, ah, you know, that will never work. And I didn't give it a second look. And um, a friend of mine actually was quite interested in it, but I, I just, yeah, didn't have a closer look at it. But um, over time, it just didn't go away. And I, I, I know that you've heard this story a million times. So there are many people that share the same journey uh, as I did. And um, I came, um, yeah, I, I looked at it from a technical perspective at first. And it was um, also this journey which led me to, to write this article series, which um, surprisingly got <laughs> quite a quite a good response online and i'm i'm very happy about that um so people seem to to like it and also share the you know the the journey of just falling deeper down this rabbit hole and trying to understand the various aspects of, of bitcoin and i i tried to you know i had like three um yeah three deep relevations or, or just three stacks of books let's put it that way <laughs> that i was trying to uh, go through and power through and it was just um, this separation which led to the three articles which was yeah it, it shattered my philosophical assumptions in a way and I learned a lot about economics because it's not my, my background and I also learned a lot or relearned a lot about uh, technological aspects which is uh, was the latest article in the series and um, yeah so about me, I've, I have a computer science background. I'm just a regular guy interested in tech and um, I'm kind of mad about myself for you know, not realizing the genius of Bitcoin earlier, but you know, it takes time and it's hard to understand. So <laughs> that's my story. <laughs> that's really amazing. I mean, when I, when I started reading your article, Gigi, um, um, I was like, that's exactly the process of, trans, of the so-called translation of the comprehension of understanding. It's really, I mean, once you get into Bitcoin, uh, and I'm not the only one, I'm not the first one who says that, but uh, you get into a, a really, uh, a multiple dimensions of comprehension. Beginning, as you said, as you written also elaborately and really um, with, a, you know, with a style of language that everybody can understand. You know, once once you really, you know, go with your heart and your soul and your intelligence and you trust your own intelligence and uh, and you go into that, you know, dimension of understanding because it's about philosophy, it's about social aspects, it's about uh, economics, specifically Austrian economics, which we never learned in school or at, or, or at university. That's a real, I mean, that's the most tragic and saddest part of history that we've been brainwashed <laughs> with all this Keynesianism. And yeah, we never weird, learned right? like, what's the essence of money. And that's why, you know, I want to ask you, what's the essence of money? What do, you, or what do you think people understand when it comes to the essence and structure and architecture of money? What's the function of money? Yeah, uh, that's, oh, that's such a broad topic. And again, I'm not an expert on it, you know. Um, I, I'm still reading through my Austrian economic <laughs> books. <laughs> and um, But it's such a weird thing in the first place that, um, otherwise, smart people just can't tell you what money is and have no idea about the history of money. And uh, it's just if you if you ask any random person what money is, they will just fl um, blankly stare at you and have no idea what what they are actually dealing with. 
And understanding that is a very big part. And that's, I think, also the reason why a lot of people jump to, you know, when you, when you ask them what is Bitcoin, they will immediately jump to gold and uh, mm -hmm. I'll talk about uh, the gold standard and, uh, yeah, the, the history of, of monetarization of gold and uh, how we ended up where we are now. And just um, understanding that, I think, is a big part. What, what money is, I think... My answer would be money is whatever people as money. So um, <laughs> that's you know <laughs> that's a, that's almost a cop out. But <laughs> I, I think um, Seyfedin did a really good job in the Bitcoin standard uh, of elaborating the difference between hard and soft money. There we go. <laughs> yeah, that's so obligatory. That, I mean, that should be like on every exactly. bookshelf. <laughs> and I, I, I hope that you agree that this one, of course, Andreas Antonopoulos, uh, Mastering Bitcoin. And these two, I think, for really layman, I mean, beginner's guide, sort of Internet of Money, Volume 1 and 2. It's just all the talks of Andreas Antonopoulos. I mean, these are, exactly. I think these are the experts or gurus as we know them, but with a really profound knowledge and an ability to translate, to communicate. Um, yeah, you Andreas know, is picture. especially good at it. And um, I mean, like, like m many others, I uh, also, yeah, I powered through all Andreas' videos and talks and everything. And I, I still do. I still watch uh, him talk in his QAs and so on mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the time. But uh, he, yeah, he's a very good communicator. Um, but Saifedean's book is really essential if you want to understand the economic perspective of, of it. And um, I would say everyone who has just a uh, superficial interest in Bitcoin, reading that book will just open your eyes um, quite, quite a lot. Mastering Bitcoin, of course, is if, if you really want to know how it works under the hood, then just to go for it and to read that. <laughs> You'll understand way, way more than you did before. Um, yeah, there are a couple of interesting books and also other articles written by people, um, mm -hmm. you know, all, all across the web. And uh, some of them are really excellent. And what I, I find interesting is that um, so many people from di different disciplines come to the topic. And you have, you know, you have traders, you have people coming from a finance background, you have economists, you have computer scientists, you have, you know, you have poker players and <laughs> you have all kinds of yeah. people that are fascinated by this topic and you could talk about like um, the, the whole spectrum is, is so wide and you could talk um, about every single puzzle piece of it for like days on end. You know, game theory and the economic incentives are such a huge part and also just the underlying security and cryptography are such a huge part. And um, also, you know, the regulation and law aspect, which uh, I know you're an expert on, is it's just such a big part because it's really, really, really hard to shut down and regulate, as we know, and um, that just changes the game. And it's, that also then leads into philosophical and also political discussions because I think Bitcoin is a highly opinion, opinionated software and it just embeds in its code certain values and certain ideas. And um, the beautiful thing about it is that you have to wrestle with those ideas because you just can't shut it down and you can't ignore it. I think in the long run, you really can't ignore it. <laughs> and we're already at a, at a point where, you know, um, just uh, yeah, the, the general consensus um, of people not knowing much about it has already shifted. So it's not this yeah. dark internet money anymore. It's not, you know, just... Uh, uh, who would have thought that it would become life. mainstream, Gigi? I mean, who would have <laughs> yeah, thought? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, and, and even though, really I mean, quickly. okay, let's, I mean, let's just break it down. I mean, how much, how, how uh, let's say conservatively, what, one to two percent of the Earth's population know about Bitcoin or hold on to Bitcoin, own Bitcoin? Would you say that's an accurate estimation or is it more like 60 million people? I have no idea about the numbers, really. It's so hard to tell. I, oh man. <laughs> yeah, there was an article of by Cesaris, a really good article by Cesaris, um, what's his name, Vences Cesaris, and the other guy also, you know, pretty well known on Twitter, Tumur, um, you know this guy, maybe he's also been a pretty uh, hardcore ah, yeah, pretty analysis. Nice, yeah, I think it's around 60 to 70 million people is the estimation. And yeah. then, and every month, 1 million people come additionally 
to that number. I mean, yeah. that is that is like if you calculate that exponentially in the next whatever five to ten years with all the other factors. Just all right. Go ahead. Oh what? yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, I mean, um, like no doubt, Bitcoin is an ex exponential technology. I'll, um, I I went a bit into detail about it in the. Uh, last article in the techno technological teachings of Bitcoin, like in the last section, I had a look at how the internet exploded and the exponential growth of the internet. And I tried to contrast uh, multiple technologies with Bitcoin. And, and, and Bitcoin really doesn't even register. Like if you look at other network technologies, which, um, which yeah, have network effects and thus behave exponentially, like, you know, the telephone with telephone lines and even like electricity and the telegraph and stuff like that. And just Bitcoin rose so quickly in the last 10 years that every analysis so far of all those technologies, Bitcoin isn't even included yet. <laughs> so um, it's really off the charts in a way. And I mean, everyone who worked with, um, um, yeah, who worked in the space and had a look at it and just, is interested in Bitcoin, even if they're just like a little bit interested, you, you just know and feel and see that it's an exponential technology. And I, I think extrapolating is, um, yeah, while it's meaningful, it's, it's really hard to do. Like with all exponential technologies, it's so hard to do. I mean, for example, the iPhone was like, you know, it came on the market like 11 years ago or so, or 12 years ago, let's say like 10 years ago. And, and the whole world has changed due to mobile computation and mobile phones and I think the next 10 years will be so wild and very hard to predict because all the exponential curves curves are like really really hard to predict so yeah th that was the graph with the um, exponential technologies but the other one is really good as well so you can see here that um, this one or this one yeah this oh. one with all the with all these quiggly lines that are going up and the other one is the internet in contrast uh, mm -hmm. with the early days so you can see here there you know all all Amazing. kind of technologies yeah. and the adoption yeah. of it and you know that that's what i'm saying like bitcoin isn't even on it it would probably shoot straight up you know what i mean <laughs> yeah. because yeah. the thing is all the techn all the technologies all the exponential technologies listed here they most of them build up on each other and bitcoin does as well and you know it's it's like multiple layers of exponential technologies building up on each other. And now in Bitcoin, we have multiple layers with like the base layer and the lightning and even layers on top of that. And uh, I think it will be just wild and extre extremely hard to predict. Like if it will, if it would take another 10 years for like true mass adoption, um, I wouldn't be surprised. But also if we would have true mass adoption in like two years, I also wouldn't be surprised. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it, it could happen so fast. Yeah, and you summarize it really nice in that one sentence on your, uh, in that article. It's just a three part series. I mean, you wrote a bunch of uh, articles, but that's like a three part series. I would recommend everyone to go on medium.com slash at their gigi or D-E-R-G-I-G-I. And you can find us all these articles and, um, and you got to read it for yourself. I mean, and this is, uh, you know, the architecture and the essence, the architecture and the root, I call it the root layer of Bitcoin is so decentralized. It is so deeply decentralized that it is just unimaginable to stop it. Uh, I mean, how, yeah, do you, exactly. how do you want to... I, I actually... I have a draft for an article um, uh, which uh, talks about that, and mm -hmm. uh, I so far have called it "How to Kill Bitcoin," you know, like a practical guide. <laughs> and if you if you really th think through that, um, it's it's amazing what you would have to do, you know. Um, so also, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people talked about that. Um, like there is. Also, this meme going around, which uh, Brandon Quidlam and other people took up, uh, like Bitcoin as a living organism, and I think that's a really fitting idea because even if you would have like a, a nuclear war and half the planet would be dead, uh, uh, Bitcoin would still march on, you know, like unaffected, and um, that's something interesting to think about. Like, it's a very powerful technology. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the core. My core questions, and that's you know the, uh, the the principal reason I wanted to talk to you is that 
you know, we all want sort of, we all in the, let's just say in the Bitcoin community, uh, uh, we that, you know, we, we've, we've studied it, we've failed, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've learned, we've understood, you know, we've relearned some things. I mean, I have learned so much like never before in my entire life. And I'm not the only one who says that, of course, you know, whether it was in school, at the university or at work, it, it's like this comprehensive knowledge, this is, it's so precious because it is really the, for me, the fundamental initiation or, or triggering of, of this process of civilization. I think it was the Austrian economist Hoppe who says the process of civilization, once we have like a, I, I'm just paraphrasing, you know, a healthy, balanced, hard money or whatever. So I think this process of civilization, this is what I want to talk to you about in a very, you know, broken down language, because what do we want? I mean, we, what I wish for myself is mass adoption, mass education, mass knowledge, and mass adoption, mass, uh, you know, a real sort of collective uh, awakening, enlightenment. Um, because there are only two ways, as we already discussed, like on the phone, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, on the chat uh, a while ago, you know, I said there are two ways that people are going to get in touch and transact and hold on to Bitcoin. Either they have the pain points, they feel it because of social, of course, social, economical, financial, uh, uh, you know, uh, governmental uh, conditions. Mm -hmm. Like in Venezuela, Turkey, Iran, Argentina, you know, anywhere where it's inflation, uh, uh, recession, unemployment, bail-ins, bail-outs, um, anywhere where, you know, people feel it, they feel it existentially. You don't need mm -hmm. to explain much to them. And the other thing, which is, which I don't see much effort or attempt, I mean, that's my humble opinion, it's not what's going on, and I, this is what I'm appealing to all Bitcoiners in the community. Let us, not in the literal sense, work together, but let us try to visualize it, communicate it. What does it mean? Let's just suppose, let's just imagine we already have the root lay of Bitcoin as the hardest money in our civilization. What does it mean for, the, for me as an individual, for everybody as an individual, and for the collective, you know, whole for the humanity as a civilization in totality, what does it mean, not only monetary, financially, technologically, but also what does it mean, you know, for the evolution of civilization? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, um, I think a lot of people are working on that. And I think there are some great, great uh, educators in the space and some great writers. I just think that it, it takes a long time, you know, it takes a long time to understand this thing. And it also takes a long time to, you know, um, uh, put everything together and uh, uh, figure out the right, yeah, the right storylines and, and the right uh, analogies and the right ways to think about it. Because, you know, we went through multiple iterations of that already. And I think Andreas is the first person who really, um, did this in a serious way, like uh, with his talks and just doing mass education on Bitcoin. But um, also he, um, like one of the, in, in the first talks he gives, he, he talks also about, you know, um, easy and fast and uh, secure and free transactions, you know. And we went completely away from this narrative because our understanding of Bitcoin evolved. And we know that, you know, nothing in life comes free in a way. And uh, uh, I think also to come back to your original point that there are only two ways, um, like with the, a painful way and a not so painful way. I think that's, that's true, but I think it's also more nuanced than that because I think there are so many things happening at the same time. And if you look at Lightning, for example, and there are, there's so many services now popping up, like, I don't know, Lolly, for example, or other cashback services where you simply shop online and you get some Satoshis back. And, and maybe that will be the first contact with Bitcoin for some people, or maybe many people. And maybe this will be the way to, to mass adoption as well, like with Cash App. Um, I mean, Jack Dorsey famously is a huge Bitcoin advocate and fan. And I think in the US, it's the, it's the best and easiest and almost like recommended way to get your hands on Bitcoin. 
And all of that is happening without any, you know, pain points or without even, um, for me, that, that, that's all, you know, I, I see it as a spectrum from whole Bitcoins to Satoshis. And on Satoshis, we already have something like a closed economy. You know, people are sending around Satoshis, playing with it, drawing some shit on Satoshis Place and uh, buying stickers and tipping each other on Twitter and everything. Like all of that is great, but that's like micro pennies. So it, it doesn't really matter. Post hyper Bitcoinization, it might be way more than <laughs> just pennies, but uh, until now it's just play money. So it's like, it's, it's the same situation we have been with Bitcoin, you know, uh, before the first pumps. So people were just sending around hundreds of Bitcoins just for fun and t- tipping each other whole Bitcoins. But on, on the other end of the spectrum, we have like, um, the, the real gold, you know, and people are willing to to pay a lot to secure it and to, to store it securely and to um, pay a lot to, in transaction fees, for example, if they want to move their coins. So I, I see it evolving in, in multiple ways. And I think that correlates with all the properties of money. I mean, you have, you have um, store of value and medium of exchange and unit of account. I think all of those three are evolving simultaneously in Bitcoin. I mean, it is already a store of value. And for some people, it's the only store of value. I mean, mm-hmm. people in Venezuela or other people that are in very dire situations, it's the only thing that really works. You know, they have to use it. And it's the only store of value which you can have in your head, which I think is absolutely fascinating. I mean, that's, that's such, such a great invention. It's, it's beyond imagination what you can do with it. I mean, imagine, um, imagine you have to flee your country for political reasons and you don't have to be very imaginative to, to think that. I mean, just take a look at history. And now you can basically take all your wealth with you if you know how to do it, even if you have to flee naked. So that's, that's even if you have to, yeah, exactly. Memorize the yeah. key. Uh, the yeah, key. yeah, exactly. Right. Just memorize twelve or twenty-four words, and you're good to go. And and, and that's that's just insane. And um, to go back to the train of thought with like for, uh, a unit of account, you know, for traders and for altcoin trainers, it is already a unit of account. Like I mean, they value everything in Bitcoin because the only thing that counts is getting more Bitcoin. <laughs> and so, it, you know what I mean? I, and it's on, on various levels, um, all of that is evolving. And I think Bitcoin already has all three aspects of money, but uh, it's just very hard to see it and to look at it in the right way. And for medium of exchange, I mean, it was a medium of exchange for a long time, and then we ran into scaling issues, and now Lightning, again, it's a medium of exchange for Satoshis now. Like, people exchange Satoshis all the time, and they buy stuff all the time. And it's really fun to see. And uh, again, I, I think, it, I think it, it can happen really quickly, um, the mass adoption you're wishing for. But uh, since understanding takes time, and like famously, you know, all the... If new ideas emerge, the people with the old ideas have to die off, like a famous physicist said it once. <laughs> I can't remember who, but uh, I, that could be true as well. And if, if you're not, you know, if you're stubborn enough, you might be stuck with your fiat. <laughs> yeah. No, you know why I think my line of thinking is because sometimes, sometimes there are moments in my thinking or in my emotions where I'm like, can we stop just, you know, talking about Bitcoin? Is it, couldn't it just be like a second nature or just, you know, our inherent nature of Bitcoin? And I'm just imagining what if, what if it was already Bitcoin? Like everything thought of, felt in, uh, estimated or assessed or, you know, projected into Satoshis. One Bitcoin is 100 million Satoshis. And I just wish that, each and every one of us would just understand not the technology behind it, but the principle, like in that, in that one paragraph, it says it all. It's extremely <laughs> rare because it's the hardest money. It is beyond gold. I mean, just this one principle, if people understand it, what it means, then we wouldn't even think one day in whatever, you know, how much Euro or dollar volatility is a Bitcoin. It's, one Bitcoin yeah, is 100 sure. million Satoshis. And I always say, well, why did you just think in the purchasing power of one Satoshi? That's 100 millionth of one Bitcoin. And Yeah, sure. But I, I mean, um, that, that would be great and all. But I think that will just take time as, uh, as Bitcoin grows and uh, um, the value behind it grows. Um, because now it's just still very unstable and it's, it's just... 
the the whole market of it is still compared to other global markets very very small and um i think it will expand and i, I think it will expand massively um there is a, a lot of value to be captured for for bitcoins and um you know having having a, a stable anything is just for me a ridiculous concept i mean nothing is ever stable ever <laughs> like even if even satoshis wouldn't be stable if it uh, post uh hyper bitcoinization because humans um just multiply and do other things and um you know i mean if 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 we colonize another planet then uh satoshis wouldn't be stable for example <laughs> and so um but understanding all, all of that, as I said, it, I think I just think it takes a lot of time. And it's also really hard to understand. I mean, uh, you just said that um, it's harder than gold. And understanding, like, even the difference between um, soft and hard money is really difficult because you just don't learn it in school. And I think you just don't learn it at all, usually. <laughs> you, you learn it by experience if you're um, in a country which has currency that hyper inflates <laughs> but uh, it's just such a, a deep topic and very very difficult to understand in, in my opinion and also just convincing people that it's a real thing and it has the properties you say it has is is really hard and takes a lot of work because in the end it's all just you know it's it's all just computer code and people have a hard time understanding that and trusting it and um just yeah, imagining something, also understanding that, that you just can't copy it, you know, and that, that it has limited supply and how this works. I, I think for people to really trust it, they either have to grow up with it and be like born with it, you know, like digital natives, they just trust the internet and they know how it works. They, they don't need to understand it in a way and they just figure it out while growing up. But for Bitcoin, I think you, you really need to understand to, to trust it, its properties and also to invest in it and. To, uh, play around with it and use it and so on and so forth and I think yeah in the next I don't know 10 years or so we won't have this problem anymore because everyone will have grown up with it and have used it and so on and so forth you know uh, it's funny you know because you just uh, mentioned the word trust and usually we talked about when we talk about Bitcoin or the blockchain you know the, the real Bitcoin blockchain it's about decentral another one decentralized it's about trustless con network consensus right yeah. we so we always use the word trustless. That means you don't need to trust anybody, but uh, do not trust, right? Verify. But on yeah. the other hand, uh, I, I mean, I, I catch myself saying then, oh, well, then people, you know, or, you know, or when you in the process of understanding, you need to trust, uh, you know, because trusting means also for me, it's not just believing, you know, I mean, you believe whatever in, in a God or whatever, but uh, trusting means knowing, understanding, comprehending, like knowing for sure, for certain, this is the mathematics, whatever algorithm, it just, <laughs> it's calculation, right? You cannot yeah. manipulate that. Isn't that true? Yes. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, yes and no. I mean, I, I know exactly what you mean. And I try to expand on that on the topic of trust in the technological teachings of Bitcoin, because trusting computer code is actually quite complicated. Mm -hmm. And also the, the, the people that talk cautiously about it never will never say trustless, but they will always say trust minimized. Mm -hmm. And um, that's that's also what Bitcoin is. It's a trust minimized system because you still have to trust some things and and um, you will very quickly run into weird things like metaphysical assumptions because you trust, for example, the mathematics behind it and you trust, for example, the physics behind it, like you trust the thermodynamics, you trust the law of thermodynamics. In the end, ther thermodynamics secures the ledger. And um, if someone figures out a way um, to do some physics where the law of thermodynamics are violated, then Bitcoin and everything else would be in huge trouble. But um, also with the mathematics, for example, you said you can just trust the mathematics because you understand it. I don't think that is ever true because um, we are not sure about all the mathematical assumptions. And for example, we are not sure about like stupid things like uh, if P is in NP or not. Like if there are some problems that are um, just... Uh, all cryptography relies on the fact that there are some problems which are... If you have a solution, the solution is very easy to um, to validate, but the solution is very hard to find. And if that is not true, you know, if there if there would be an algorithm for 
for everything, so to speak. For example, finding primes is an example. You know, if, if there would be just an, an algorithm that says, give me the two millionth prime, um, then we would be in big trouble in the cryptography world because then you can no longer rely on the security, which is the security basically is everyone would have to brute force the problem. And if that's no longer the case, then our cryptographic assumptions were wrong and then all cryptographic systems would be broken. So trust is a very, very tricky business. <laughs> Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, also in Bitcoin, uh, but al also in the world generally. I mean, what, what can you trust? And uh, also philosophically speaking, I don't think there is 100% absolute certainty about anything because, you know, we could be in the matrix, we could be in, in a dream, we could be... Uh, in a weird alien simulation and they're just harvesting our brains you know <laughs> so speaking about those absolutes is, is really tricky if you think about it deeply enough but i don't think bitcoin claims any of that you know the, the people that really know what they're talking about will always tell you that this is a trust minimized system and you should do your own research and i think what is even more important than trust minimization in a way is um that in Bitcoin, you can do everything yourself, you know, you, you can be 100% self-sovereign and you can just be your own bank if you want to. You can have, you can have it as trust minimized as you would like it to have, you know, you, you can just, and also you can take it or leave it. That's also a great thing. You know, you, you, mm -hmm. it's an opt-in system. You're not forced by anyone to use it. It's, it's the same with, I mean, you, you, maybe you will be forced by society to use it. It's the same with, you know, joining Facebook and having a cell phone and uh, everything like that. You might end up having to use it because otherwise you will be not part of the society anymore. But that's uh, different than the states do it currently. Um, now, I love the, your approach and especially how you elaborate it in your articles. Uh, also, for, of course, from a philosophy. But what is philosophy? I mean, it, in, it comprises a lot of other aspects, you know, like uh, sociology, psychology, emotions, relationships. And, you know, I got, um, I just wanted to show you, I have, this is my, one of my favorite, um, uh, I don't know where I have it from. Maybe I, I don't know, I just figured it out for myself. But <laughs> this, is, this is a quote I just, you know, put on my website trust is the essence of every relationship and i mean we do have a, a crisis of trust if you think about it we do have a crisis of trust uh within in every you know aspect and corner and and shithole of this civilization i mean whether it's the structures the entities the you know interrelational uh stuff whether it be partnership business you know, a trust to, to the compartmentalized school system, uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's yeah, not sure. one, one aspect where trust is not like, uh, you know, a, a, a fundamental feature or, 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 or issue that we have mm -hmm. to deal with. So is, is this, I mean, do you see trust, I mean, trusting relationships or, or, you know, human beings trusting one another and trusting a, a transactional uh, foundation or root layer such as Bitcoin uh, for the benefit of humanity? You know, I mean, is it just weird the question or do, do you know what I'm getting at? <laughs> or is um, it too philosophical? I, I think I know what you're... No, 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 I, that's great. Uh, I think it's very important to talk about these things because um, in, in general, trust is a great thing and you should trust people in a way. You shouldn't trust them in Bitcoin, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> disclaimer, don't trust me. Always, always verify and do your own research. But um, in general, you know, for example, in families, it's very good to trust uh, each other. Otherwise, uh, it just won't, won't work out. And I think the problem you describe is just a scaling problem in a way. As, as long as families get very, very large and civilization gets very, very large and things get very complex, it's just cheating gets very beneficial and uh, people can get away with it. And I think that's the root problem. Uh, it, it, it just incentivizes cheating in a way. In a family, you're not getting away with your cheating. You know what I mean? It's just you, you have to trust each other. And if this trust is broken, you will be shunned for the, from the family. And historically, that means death. So um, we're past it. <laughs> and so cheating isn't uh, something that kills you anymore, uh, usually. But, uh, and I just mean cheating in a general sense. I don't mean necessarily in relationships or anything like that. But mm -hmm. if, if you just 
break the trust of your core group, then uh, you're shunned from the group and in, in a tribal society, that, that isn't a good thing. And what I think what Bitcoin does beautifully is just um, scaling trust to the extreme. Like, um, that's also where the trustlessness comes from in a way. You, you don't have to trust other people and you don't even have, have to trust your Bitcoin peers in a way. You just trust the physics and the mathematics of it and you can verify everything yourself. Mm -hmm. And that scales really, really, really well. But I still think that trust on the layers on top of Bitcoin is a very valuable concept. And we see that uh, on the Lightning Network, for example. I mean, if I have a channel with you, I trust you in a way. And uh, if there is any dispute, like if the trust is broken, we always can go back to the source of truth uh, and settle on Bitcoin on the base layer. And I think that's how how any system kind of scales in the real world as well. I mean, it also does in, in the legal system, for example. I mean, people generally trust each other. And if there is a dispute, you just, you know, then the law will kick in in a way and you will go, go to court and fight it out. And I think um, those are just very, very general problems of scaling and of networks and of social cooperation. And I think Bitcoin is doing the right thing there and scaling in a similar way. Mm -hmm. Um, Gigi, uh, so what do you, I mean, where do you, where do you see this development going then? I mean, okay, let's just, let's just, you know, uh, uh, sort of fast forward. Uh, I know, you know, we're not an Oracle or something like that, but let's say, say in five to 10 years, you know, with that rate of speed going on in, you know, in the technological, in the innovation, in the, you know, interconnectedness of, of, of collaborations, of, of solving uh, problems w where i mean where do you where do you see where do you see the individual and 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 the communities and uh, uh, where do you see the borders uh, is there a, like a bigger picture that we can communicate uh, this is you know where i'm getting at because i want to sort of visualize what is possible at least you know uh, on a minimum scale what is possible for us as humanity? Because uh, I mean, we just talked about trust, but trust is also about ethos in a way, you know? Like it's not something I don't do because I'm afraid I'm gonna get punished, but because it is the right thing to do. It is correct, it is ethical, you know? Uh, it is something that, that, that is, you know, shareable, that, that, you know, gives a benefit not only to myself, but to my, you know, to whatever, not only to my family, but to, to, to my neighbors, to my friends, to my colleagues, to community in large. Does my question make sense to you? I mean, going back to the very first question, either there is, you know, people need to suffer and, and out of that suffering is uh, creativity evolved, or there's this other path like, wow, for the first time I understand what is possible with this kind, yeah. with all these features of bit, hmm. whatever, of Bitcoin, let's just say. Yeah, I think a lot of people have this experience of, oh, wow, now all kinds of things are possible suddenly. Uh, <laughs> and I think, I mean, I'm sure you, you know the quote, the future is already here, it's just not distributed evenly. <laughs> so um, I think we see a lot of that uh, currently. I mean, there are, there are people already showing you what is possible in a um yeah in a, in a world where where um value can be transferred as effortlessly as just a picture or a meme or anything and i you know i'm 50 percent optimistic and 50 percent um, pessimistic uh, regarding the future <laughs> i'm very optimistic about bitcoin's future but in general we are living in very strange times and um i think um the exponential progress of technologies and of connecting people and of sharing ideas and everything else uh, made everything quite unstable compared with the last several thousand years <laughs> and i think we're at an inflection point in history and i have no idea where it's going i don't know if it will end up being very good or very bad but i think it will be very something <laughs> so um all those technologies are very powerful and uh, as with all technologies people can use them for good and for bad i think Bitcoin will enable massive collaboration. And I think we already see that. And we see that like 
especially in the Bitcoin space currently, because that are the people that are just most knowledgeable. And I think there is a, um, a huge information asymmetry going on. So not a lot, uh, like, I mean, after the last bull run, most people have heard of Bitcoin and it was in the news and so on and so forth. But what it is and what it can do and how it works, almost nobody knows. And mm -hmm. even like people studying computer science don't know that. And uh, <laughs> also economists don't know it. I mean, it's just uh, mind blowing how many people are still ignorant uh, about it. And I think looking at the people closest to it, you can already see what's, what's happening and what's going on with crowdfund crowdfundings all over the place. I mean, just moving money around the globe is so easy now that if someone is in legal trouble, for example, there will just be a, a crowdfund started and everyone who is a fan of the guy will just throw in a buck or two and he will have half a million dollars to defend himself. And this happened already and it's happening all the time. Same goes for developers, the same goes for, you know, people, like if you can do work on the internet, anything of value, you can now get paid for it and people are doing it all the time. Yeah. I think what's also very interesting is that uh, tipping culture is evolving around that. And yeah. uh, I mean, for example, street performers and stuff like that, uh, they live off tipping since forever, you know, since hundreds or thousands of years, you always have people that just throw down their hat and do something that is either funny or, or useful for someone or just interesting in a way. And, and just this, you know, pay what you want model in a way, uh, has mm -hmm. existed forever yeah. it worked on the internet and that's how i think we ended up with just an advertisement and spyware based model i mean just every company that is worth something spies on you and sells the user data and it's just a horrible dystopia just extrapolating that i mean i think we are already living in a horrible dystopia uh, if you look at facebook and all the scandals they're involved in yeah. also Google. And I think Bitcoin could be the antidote to that because it just introduces a very, very different or multiple very different business models. And I'm, I'm very, very optimistic about it. What the future will bring in the next five to 10 years, I mean, I have no idea. You know, like, again, 10 years ago, we barely had an iPhone. And that's next, amazing. Yeah. I mean, who would have thought of that, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, it will be so wild. You know, I think a lot of things are very, very obvious. Uh, all the things that people are talking about with, you know, streaming money and you pay a streaming video by the frame and just everything you pay for now currently will pay in Bitcoin and just easier and without a third party and without censorship and mm -hmm. without any intermediaries. Um, but I think the most interesting things, as they always do, they will come out of left field and they will totally surprise us. And people will come up with new solutions to problems you didn't even know you had. You know? And I, I can't tell you what it is. I mean, there are so many smart and creative people working in this space. I'm sure there will be some interesting thing in the, in the next two months, probably. In the next six months, <laughs> everything's moving so fast. <laughs> Excellent, yeah. Um, okay, let me um, let me just for the final conclusion. Okay, let me let me wrap it up for myself um, and reflect upon it with you together. So you know what my wish is is that um, I guess it's uh, it's our wish, our desire of all the people in the Bitcoin community. You know, whether it's you, Andreas Antonopoulos, Safed and Amus, uh, you know, all these cryptographers, the coders, the programmers who are so much dedicating you know their time their resources their energy their heart and blood their their intelligence their knowledge their wisdom into the development into the evolution of this what do we call it network uh decentralization you know all these unique features um what i see is that because bitcoin can for the first time in human history in human evolution, for the first time, decentralize, de-root this centralized system. And with that, every other aspect, every other facet of this structure on this planet will just decentralize by itself because we don't need to fight the old system, as I always say, you know, we just create new structures, new evolutionary networks. We, we work with one another, we communicate with one another, we interact dynamically with one another. And by creating something new, something evolutionary, the old structures become obsolete by itself. And that, with that, I don't only mean, you know, on the monetary, financial, economic, in the classical sense, but in every aspect, on every level you can think of. I mean, 
I find it peculiar, to be honest with you, very strange that for more than 100 years, we're still transporting ourselves with combustion engines by burning fuel. <laughs> Isn't that weird or strange? On every other level, we've had like exponential evolution, you know, in technology. I mean, just you just mentioned the iPhone or whatever, a smartphone, or but I'm like, maybe with this, this, you know, to be honest with you, I mean, I just call it the criminal patent system because it's a theft system. And I'm not the only expert, you know, who says that from a legal background with a legal background. But if that dissolves, if that becomes obsolete. We finally, we finally make technology usable and servable to humanity. Yeah, um, there's a lot in there. I mean, um, regarding the patents and stuff, and also the, um, I think all of that is is already happening. I think uh, you're right with um, seeing that as a parallel system that is evolving in a way. Uh, I see it in the same way, I think, uh, and I'm very happy about that because before Bitcoin, I always thought we will have a very big crash and everything will go to shit and then rebuild from scratch. But I think what's happening now is just, yeah, it's evolving side by side. And um, like the internet made many other um, things like newspapers, for example, obsolete. Um, and that happened gradually and it happened side by side. I mean, it was bad for the newspapers, of course, and I think Bitcoin will be bad for the banks. But I think we also... Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. I think the, the war hasn't even started yet because um, I think what Bitcoin needs to survive next is a state-level attack, and I think that will come. Um, you I think, think so? State, really? I think so. Yeah, I wow. think so. Okay, I think, that's something. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think um, um, the people behind the money printing process won't give them up easily. So I'm, But isn't I'm it too late? I mean, hasn't it, uh, you know, that point? Uh, maybe. I oh. hope. <laughs> okay. It's, it's very hard to tell because uh, those people are very smart as well. And uh, um, I, that's, that's why I like what you're doing and just uh, educating people and educating the masses, so to speak, on, on these kind of topics because they're important. And I think we were very complacent with the internet, for example. And we ended up where Facebook and Google just captured the open internet completely. And we don't really have an open internet anymore. You know, I mean, everything is captured by monopolists companies and, and I think the same could happen with Bitcoin in, in, in a way that you have Bitcoin banks for example like Coinbase and other things and that's not necessarily a bad thing but people need to be aware and need to be educated what's happening there um, like if you're you, you know there's the saying uh, uh, Andreas says it all the time I think uh, know your keys know your, know your Bitcoin so yeah. I think and uh, that really needs to be drilled into the head of the people. That, that's true. And I think that the same should have been done on the internet. You know, if, if the service is free, then, then you're the product. And um, we kind of failed on that front um, mm -hmm. on the internet. I, I just see you've opened up my, my Twitter profile. That's not my usual hand, handle. It's just... Oh, really? Know, what is it? What is it? What is just it? Just GG. Uh, no, no, it's, it's, the handle is real, but the name is just GG usually. I'm just going by uh, uh, GG now McCormick because there's a legal battle going on and I'm... That's why myself. I was so confused. I'm like, who is this McCormick? You know, I'm following you. What is this guy? <laughs> yeah. No, there, there was a, that was also a fun time. Uh, everyone was holding out for a couple of days. So, but that's a, just a twin thing. Um, to go back to the, to the point of... Um, uh, how all of this might evolve. I, I think you're right that a second um, economy, in a way, is is growing, and I think it will grow bigger and bigger. And I, I, I'm conflicted about also the, um, you know, the advocating for Bitcoin part in a way that everyone is doing because I, I'm more and more of the opinion that uh, Bitcoin doesn't really need that in a way. I like Bitcoin doesn't need us. It, it will grow on its own and it's just so good at what it's doing and it's just so good at capturing value and transferring value that mm -hmm. in the end people will have to educate themselves anyway and will have to join the boat anyway. But uh, I think good education like Andreas does it for example can uh, of course um, expedite the process as well and uh, just onboard people faster and uh, hopefully um, recruit some advocates for uh, for example or just uh, guide people in their understanding yeah <laughs> that's that's my my view on that yeah well said well said excellent 
Um, well, Gigi, okay, I'm going to, um, let's just wrap this up because people are going to be probably overloaded with, <laughs> uh, with our talk and with so much knowledge. <laughs> um, is there like anything like you want to say, like final thoughts or, uh, you know, where people can find you or, you know, some final positions that you have where you say, you know, this is really important, people should check or, you know, I'm, I'm going to add your, your infos in the video description below anyway, but um, yeah, I'm, um, I'm there, there are Gigi everywhere, pretty much. So if you have my handle on one platform, you have, you have them all. <laughs> Not very privacy aware, but <laughs> that's how I roll. And as final thoughts, um, basically just educate yourself, you know, yeah. um, it's, it's, I know it's over overwhelming and I know it's a lot, but um, there are some really good resources out there. I think the list by James Lop is one of the best. And um, yeah, read the Bitcoin standard, educate yourself. Um, don't trust too much what other people are saying. Try to understand it for yourself. And just also have fun with it and uh, try it out and see what this can do, this, this thing, this beast that we call Bitcoin. And yeah, um, you know, have fun on the ride. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, people don't have to lose anything. I mean, they're not losing and they're actually gaining uh, at least, you know, knowledge, experience and, you know, and they don't need to whatever, you know, put up the mortgage on, on anything. You know, I'm, I always say to people, you don't need a whole Bitcoin. Just get yourself a few Satoshis and learn, with, just learn, have the wow experience. You know, what is it like to hold or hodl or own or possess or whatever or interact in one way or another also with the community? Because this is like the journey of, uh, you know, of, uh, the first journey of exchanging knowledge, sharing knowledge with one another and, you know, learning from oneself's uh, failures and mistakes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, Gigi, thank you so much. I hope to see you soon. Uh, you know, sometime maybe you'll come back to Vienna, Austria. Are you originally from Vienna or, or, uh, or from other county or state of Austria? No, I'm, I'm from, from, another, from another state, but I'll, I'll keep it to myself for now. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Well, thank you so much. And... Uh, I'll, yeah, Thanks. let's talk pleasure. soon and we'll Great do the German pleasure. version hopefully soon. All right? Yeah, let's do that. All right. Okay. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.